Hello, everybody. Hello. Thank you for coming to my talk. Um, we're going to talk about garage door hacking. Um, how many people have a garage? Probably most everybody in the room. Um, the talk was about on a budget, and I'll get to that in a second. But first, uh, about a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Trevor Kems. Uh, I'm a penetration tester at Waterleaf International. I don't know why the slide's all messed up. But um, uh, I got my BS in cybersecurity engineering uh, from Iowa State in 2021. And I got my OSCP in August of 2022. Um, I really like to do hardware hacking and reverse engineering in my free time. And uh, as the image shows, I like to collect and restore vintage computers. So in this case, that's a Mac SE uh, that's fully restored. I retrobrited it if you know what retrobriting is, um, out in the sun one day. And I will say all opinions in this presentation are my own and not of my current or former employers. A uh, quick little disclaimer uh, beyond the one I just said. Um, I am not a lawyer, and this is not legal advice. Uh, transmitting on certain frequencies in the United States is kind of iffy at best. Um, Check the local laws before you do this. Uh, if you have like something like a hacker ref or a flipper, you can get in a lot of trouble if you do the wrong stuff. Just make sure you are staying below the legal limits. You can transmit if it's short, low power, uh, and there's a bunch of different things on the FCC website that you can follow. Uh, but in addition to that side, Make sure you use the information in this presentation for good, not evil. Um, I'm a penetration tester, so ethics has been ingrained in my head forever. But uh, some of this stuff that we talk about today could be used against your neighbors or um, businesses and things like that. So uh, keep ethics in mind and don't use this maliciously. And then uh, we're going to talk about the Chamberlain Group in a second, but um, uh, all the trademarks and word marks in this presentation are property of theirs usually, um, or their respective owners. Um, so everybody thinks that garage door openers are secure. Um, most people think that when they close a garage door, not many people are going to be able to open it. Um, when I gave this talk in 2022 at B-Sides, I gave a version of this talk then, um, garage door openers were becoming less and less secure. Uh, if you've heard of a person called Sammy Kamkar, uh, he did a, a series of vulnerabilities, uh, first being Open Sesame, where he took a IME, that's the one on the left there, uh, and he was able to use a De Bruin sequence and break garage doors that had a fixed code. We'll get to fixed code in a second. Um, and then he came out a little bit later about uh, the attack Roll Jam. And Roll Jam was uh, an interesting attack in regards to replaying any rolling code out there. Um, that's the rolling codes that you use in your car, your garage, who, who knows what ro uses rolling codes nowadays. Um, but Sammy Kamkar does a really good job explaining these in videos and talks of his own, so go check him out. But um, I'm going to show you how you don't even have to worry about that for about 80% of garage doors in the United States. So it's probably actually higher than that, but the only number I can find is around 80%. Um, the 80% number comes from the Chamberlain Group. Um, they are a conglomerate, essentially, uh, based out of Illinois. And if you recognize any of the brands up, in the, up on the screen right now, and if your garage door is these brands, you are probably affected by these series of vulnerabilities we're going to talk about tonight. Um, these include like LiftMaster. If you have any of the professional series, the regular ones, I was noticing that the, there's LiftMaster garage doors in this very building. Um, but things like Chamberlain, it's less common, but Craftsman, if you buy any Craftsman garage door openers in the last, I think, like 15 years, they're also vulnerable. Uh, and then some lesser brands are also included. Go check out their Our Brands page to make sure. Um, they're owners of the Security Plus and Security Plus 2.0 protocols. Um, we'll talk about those in depth in this presentation, but um, those are the big hitters, uh, essentially, in the industry today. Uh, they also own the MyQ branding. If you've ever done any smart home stuff with your garage door, you're probably really frustrated with MyQ at some level. Um, I hate them too, but um, they're really uh, they're really hard to work with and very locked down. I'll just leave it at that. Um, and then a lot of people don't know is they're really big into the access control and gate space. So. Um, uh, just an example, I was on an actual physical pen test and found a uh, 
I think it was LiftMaster, it was, it was branded LiftMaster gate that used a fixed code. And I'll talk about fixed codes, as I said in a minute, but um, uh, this was probably from 20 years ago, still in use today. So they're expanding outside of some other ones, uh, some other just garage door openers. But uh, that's their headquarters in Illinois on screen. Um, but uh, they're actually owned by Blackstone. They got bought out recently. Um, so as I said, where does that 80% 80, 80 number come from? Uh, I found this graph on Statistica, I think is how you say it. Um, and those red boxes are the brands of uh, the Chamberlain Group. Uh, so you can see, obviously, LiftMaster and Chamberlain hold the majority share. LiftMaster is 50% of new construction, essentially, in 2018. And I personally, anecdotally, have gone into many houses over the years. And every time I'm at a garage sale or somebody's house, I'll like, and I'm in their garage, I'll look up and see the garage, and it's like 95% of the time it's Chamberlain. And they make new ones that are red, so they're really easy to see, or blue, like this one up here that I have on the, on the table. Um, but odds are it's probably Chamberlain. And this is a problem that we'll talk about in a second. So we're talking about a little bit of the history of garage door security. Um, but first off, it, it, this has been around for a while. Like 1930s, technology was kind of the start. It was developed by two different teams kind of around the same time. Uh, obviously, wanting to control your garage is not a hard idea to come up with remotely. Um, but it was really popularized in the 1970s. Uh, because obviously people uh, wanted to miniaturize, miniaturize the technology, right? They had transistors, they can shrink it down, battery powered. Um, and, and then in the 80s, mid 80s, and then in, in, into the early 90s, we saw dip switches. That's what this uh, image here of the remote is. Um, they're still in use today. Uh, you can actually see these a lot of the places with dip switches. Um, they're less common, and usually they're higher uh, dip switch count, so it would be like, 12 instead of, it. I think this one has nine. Yeah, this was nine. Uh, but uh, I pulled this image directly from Amazon for, uh, like two days ago. So they're still sold. They're still in use. It, it's, it can get pretty bad. Um, but as, as time progressed, they got smart to the um, vulnerabilities that Sammy Kamkar kind of uh, addressed. Um, I don't think anybody really brought this to their attention, but they saw like if your neighbor set their garage door codes to yours, they could open it. Well, that's bad. So they came up with rolling code technology. Um, that's the billion code, uh, Security Plus and Security Plus 2.0. Um, we'll get into both of the last two in this talk. Uh, billion code is very similar, uh, but it's used uh, a lot of other places. Um, but the difference between dip switches and rolling codes is that dip switches uh, transmit the same code every time. If I can capture the code at any point, I can replay it infinitely. Rolling code means I have to essentially generate something before I can transmit. So that would be to prevent things like relay attacks. Uh, roll jam that Sammy, Sam, Sammy Kamkar um, uh, implemented was an attack against the fact that most people, if your garage door doesn't work the first press, what are you going to do? Press it again. And you're going to think, oh, it was out of range or it wasn't working. And what it does is it stores n plus 1 codes and replays the last one and jams the garage door opener. Um, fun fact, you don't have to do that. If you can just capture one code at any point, we'll talk about why this is dangerous, uh, I can get into your garage door forever. Um, but, and that affects both of the protocols, Security Plus and Security Plus 2.0. Um, I wanted to talk about remotes a little bit um, uh, because in this talk there's a few remotes I have. Um, I have both of the old style, which is the Security Plus remote, which is the black, and you can kind of tell um, it's the one on the right top. Um, it has uh, kind of parentheses looking things, uh, circles. That is Security Plus. That's the older standard. These aren't compatible with if you have like a brand new garage door. And then uh, in the middle there, uh, this is a brand new one that actually goes to this, uh, it's paired to this garage door. This came from the factory. Uh, yeah, I'm a nerd and I went to Menards and bought a garage door <laughs> just for this, uh, for my B-Sides talk. Um, felt kind of weird walking in Menards just buying this, but nobody questioned me, so. Mm. But um, there's a bunch of different remotes you can buy. I'll talk about some of my gripes about them in a minute. But um, there's also ones that you can put outside of your garage for like keypad access, for if you have like kids coming home from school, they don't have to have an opener with them. And then they uh, started making keychain remotes as well, which are really handy, right? Because if you have a bunch of garages and you don't want to, you're not in your car a lot, or you're in a bunch of different cars, you can do that. 
and the red ones are uni quote unquote universal remote that works with a bunch of different brands. Um, so, oh dang, that's covering up. But um, Security Plus and Security Plus 2.0 are kind of the main meat vulnerability uh, that we're going to talk about today. Um, I call them encrypted in quotes because we'll get to that in a second why they're not really encrypted. Um, I'm a big crypto nerd, as in cryptography, so uh, it's not in my mind encrypted, but they are rolling codes at least, um, which means they don't send the same code every time. Uh, and that's one of Chamberlain's marketing strategies is saying your code can never be replayed. And that is true to some extent. Um, don't get too fast. Um, they were introduced in 1997, so they're pretty, um, uh, pretty old at this point, uh, at least Security Plus, but they're very similar to each other. Um, Security Plus uh, is not really supported by the newer openers, only Security Plus 2.0, but you can find some openers that support both. It's kind of a mixed bag depending on when it was manufactured. Um, it was phased out for Security 2.0, um, Security Plus 2.0 in 2011. So um, if odds are if you have a, like a house that was manufactured and you purchased it after roughly 2015 probably, you probably have 2.0. Uh, mixed bag though because my parents bought, uh, built their house after 2011 deadline and it still had security plus 1.0. So that's why I put both of them in here uh, and we'll talk about both of them uh, in a breakdown. Uh, just a quick note, uh, Sammy Kamkar actually mentions both of these protocols and says to use them. And I will say why I somewhat disagree with him a little bit on that topic. Uh, but mainly it's because the fact that he, um, his idea is correct, but uh, the way that you can attack these protocols is very similar to his attacks. And then uh, Chamberlain also states in their website, I pulled this screenshot, I know it's kind of small, I'll upload these slides afterwards if you want to read them. Uh, but they kind of talk about how it's, oh, it's so secure and that kind of thing. Uh, and we'll talk about why that's not the thing. When I was first looking into this, um, I was very skeptical of their encryption. Um, the left screenshot uh, or image that I took um, is on the box that I bought this opener in uh, from Menards. I still have the box because I uh, wanted to make sure I kept that documentation. But it's, it states, unmatched security plus 2.0 registered. 100 billion code encryption prevents against RF hacking. And then they have the posi lock or whatever they call it, and that's the deadbolt essentially on your garage door. We're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about Security Plus 2.0. And then they also talk about billion code encryption. This is on a uh, keypad outside your house. Um, I was very skeptical of this is encryption because you're running at 300 megahertz. And I don't know of an encryption standard that has that low of data rate and is secure and has a key. First, I thought it was key lock, but it's not. Uh, I did a bunch of research and uh, kind of went down the rabbit hole and found out that somebody has done the same. Um, you can check out this GitHub right now. Uh, Clayton Smith, nice guy, I reached out to him uh, before my B-Sides talk and um, talked about uh, Security Plus and Security Plus 2.0 and presenting it. And I did not fully reverse engineer this. Full disclaimer, um, I'm just presenting ways you can effectively use this. Um, but he did a lot of the heavy lifting for these protocols. And these have been implemented in things like the Flipper. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, the, essentially, that implementation was, I think, uh, based on a lot of the SEC Plus work. Uh, if you're familiar with RTL 433, uh, which is uh, IoT, it has a bunch of different protocols listed in it. That was included in there as well uh, for R RTL SDRs. Um, but it also supports GNU radio scripts. So if you're familiar with um, HackerF and any of those platforms, uh, I think Lime SDR is also supported. Um, you can actually read codes out of the air, and we'll do that later in a demo. Um, check it out. Uh, I'll, as I said, I'll upload these slides as well, but um, uh, you can just read this if you have one of these, but we're on a budget. Who wants to spend $300 on a HackerF, right? Um, first, though, well, let's talk about the encryption a little bit more. It'll be technical. Um, Security Plus uses rolling codes to secure access, as, we, as I said, but it, it does it kind of weirdly. It splits up the packets into two separate uh, 20 payload bit packets uh, that are then combined together at the opener side. 
Um, it uses a weird trinary system. So um, essentially you have uh, three different uh, kind of, I don't know what to call them, symbols. I, I put symbols here, but um, three is being invalid. So uh, there is actually, it's four bits, but uh, the third option is invalid. It's, it's a little weird, but if you look at the sec plus, you can actually see and break down the uh, technical side. And that's what I did. I went and actually hand decoded a lot of these messages and uh, to figure out how it works. Highly recommend if you're interested in this, do that. Um, a little tedious, but it's fine. It's only, it's only 40 bits, it's fine. Um, but the main meat of this is that you have two primary uh, data in that message. You have a fixed data section and a rolling uh, data section. Uh, obviously the rolling is gonna be that thing that changes every time and the fixed is gonna be your essential identifier. So this contains stuff like the remote ID, so serial number of the remote essentially. Uh, your button that you pressed, because uh, in this case we have three button remote in this case, so you gotta know like did you press one, two, or three to open up. And then on things like the keypad, it's gonna be the pin number because uh, luckily Chamberlain didn't implement pin uh, uh, validation on the outside of your house. They, they make the opener do it. Um, but we'll get into why you can kind of still break it anyways. Um, the max for each of these is a little weird. Uh, Security Plus is kind of big. The ranges are big, the three to the 20. So that's, that's a pretty big range of uh, values for the fixed piece, and it's two to the 32. So that's what, four billion combinations for the rolling section. Um, but it increases by two every time you press the button. Um, Security Plus 2.0 is a little different, we'll get into that in a second, but these are very hard to brute force even if you know the data, because they're so huge. So I don't think brute forces or uh, attacks against garage doors are gonna happen anytime soon, but there's other attacks we'll talk about that are even worse. Um, Security Plus 2.0, as I said, is very similar. Um, they do a little bit of different uh, encoding. They use Manchester encoding, if you're familiar with that. Um, and they, I think they uh, transmit at twice the data rate, therefore. Uh, there is some little difference about the length of the data. Uh, there's 40 payload bits each packet, so two packets still and 40 uh, payload bits each. Um, but they decrease the rolling bits uh, to two to the 28. Uh, and they only increase by one each press. Um, I'm just speculating, but I bet they did that because they had a bunch of remotes out in the wild and they were reaching the three to the 20 uh, limit because they're a huge manufacturer and they didn't want to overlap. Um, and then the fixed portion is even bigger. It's two to the 40. Uh, same breakdown, you have a serial number, buttons, pin, all that fun stuff. But this time they were smarter and they interleave the bits together. So there's a bunch of weird bit operations that happen um, it may be for kind of redundancy or something. I don't know, um, but that's what they did. And uh, Sec Plus breaks it down really great. Highly recommend you go check out the Python uh, files that he has. They're pretty easily readable. They're pretty commented. Um, but that's the enc encryption, quote unquote encryption, um, that they use. So I talked about attacks. So there's three main attacks. Uh, the last one is kind of hard to think of in this case, but the first one I can think of is just a denial of service. So in this case, if I capture your remote transmission at any point, anywhere in the world, and I have it, I could go to your garage door opener and lock you out. Because this little pie graph at the bottom shows how the logic of the opener works. So the red section, in that pie graph is what I would consider valid codes. So the opener says, okay, I'm gonna say, take N plus 20, and any of those codes I'm gonna trust, because maybe you accidentally hit their opener, or you have it in your pocket, something happens, whatever, doesn't matter. I'm gonna trust those implicitly. And then the blue section is N plus 20 plus, let's say, 100. And if in that range, you press the remote two times in a row, it will resync and move the top uh, window of where it's transmitting or accepting to that new point. Um, you may notice this if you go on vacation and press your remote a bunch and come back, you might have to press it two times before you get in your garage. Um, usually it's just you're out of range, but um, if you do notice this, and this does work, I've proven that this does uh, work in garage doors, that there, there is a resync window. And then outside of that is the gray that's invalid. So if you're in that range, it's not going to work. Mainly you want to look behind, right? You don't want to see anything behind it. 
and then obviously a head. Denial of service happens if I can transmit a code just right at the edge of the resync window, and then now it skips all the way forward, and now your remote doesn't work until you press it a thousand times, or however many times the resync window is, or you repair it. Um, this is really annoying. Uh, I'll get why it's really annoying because most people, when they, this doesn't work, uh, they will just go buy a new remote because they think their remote's broken. Um, uh, the second attack is a persistent replay. If I capture your remote at any time, I can come back any time in the future as long as that remote's still working and access your garage. Doesn't matter how many times you press the button, doesn't matter how many times you've added different remotes, I can come back and guess, uh, let's say two every 2,000 codes, and it's only gonna take maybe a couple seconds, and there you go, you're, you're in your garage. Um, essentially, this makes remotes useless once they're broken. Remotes cannot be reset, they cannot change, they are static. They have a battery inside and some static uh, memory, that's it, you can't reprogram them, they're essentially just a counter at every point. Um, and then the last one I talked about a little bit, you can attempt to brute force some of the rolling code information if you have some of the fixed code information, like the serial number of the remote and things like that. But in my experience, the, um, the information on the outside of the remote doesn't correspond to like the serial number of the bits. So you can't like take a picture and try to guess. Um, it'd be really nice if somebody figured that out, but I don't think it exists. So uh, it's hard, the key space is fairly large, but it, it is a, a valid attack in my opinion if you were to gain information at that point. I did want to include it. So now that I've scared everybody about the garage doors, um, what can you do? So a lot of people don't know there's a lock button on your garage on the side uh, of, on the button on the wall usually, especially newer ones. Um, I don't think this one has one, but uh, if you have just a basic button, you probably don't. But if you have a big pad looking thing, you lift up the button, there's probably a lock button underneath. Um, Chamberlain says to use this like when you go on vacation or you're not gonna use your garage for a while. Um, you could use this at night when you're at home and you don't want anybody accessing your garage. Uh, just know that your garage is not gonna open even when you get up in the morning and go to work, you have to press the lock button again. Uh, but you have to be inside your garage to do that. Uh, you can have a camera, MyQ system, kind of monitoring as well. Um, but in, in that case, it's more of reactive instead of proactive. Um, I would highly recommend you stop using remotes if you think they've been captured because you can kind of guess that they've probably been captured, forget your remotes, and then uh, continue forward. But your remotes will probably just get captured again. Um, I mentioned this to somebody before the talk, uh, vote with your wallet. Um, if you don't like this practice, tell Chamberlain. Say that I don't want Chamberlain garage doors in your, in your new house or when you go to buy a next, your next garage door. Um, I know it's hard, it's a large market share, um, but push for encrypted systems, right? We have crypto that's it's super advanced now for like TLS is light years ahead of this. Why can't we have that in our garage doors, right? Um, and then one simple thing that I've done um, is lock the, the door between your house and your garage. Treat that as another front door to your house. A lot of people don't do this. They think their garage door is secure enough and don't lock that door. So imagine an attacker is able to get in your garage, now they're in your house. They have access to your computers, your electronics, your whatever in your house. And now I'm not saying you don't have valuable stuff in your garage, but there's, there's issues with um, getting access to your house instead of your garage in most cases. Um, I've really considered uh, implementing something like uh, Kismet, if you're familiar with Kismet, for RF frequencies like garage doors and things like that where you want to monitor and they'd say this remote was used at this point. So you could get a like, notification on your phone saying somebody used remote ID number three at your house and you're like, I'm away from home. That wasn't supposed to happen. Um, Again, more proactive though. So making sure you can find systems that are encrypted is important. So how do you implement these attacks? Um, I mentioned the flipper already, um, but those are 200 bucks. Uh, they do do Security Plus and uh, Security Plus 2.0 transmissions, uh, but without custom firmware, you can't um, make custom remotes and replay things uh, pretty easily. Uh, but if you do custom firmware, uh, I think they allow you to do a lot of that stuff pretty easily. Uh, not too hard to flash firmware like that, but just keep that in mind. It is $200 uh, if you can get one, um, but I have one and it does work. On top of that, you can buy HackerRef 
Um, I highly recommend you buy a Porta Pack if you do. That's why I listed it. Um, but they're still, I, I'd say, around three to four hundred dollars if you get the Porta Pack and all the, all the accessories you want with it, the antennas and stuff like that. Um, but there's a lot of advantages. You don't have to just use this for garage door hacking. You can use it for a lot of RF stuff. Um, and then you get a lot of bandwidth for the money. You can watch TV, digital TV on your Hacker F, essentially. So that's really nice too. But um, what I really wanted to talk about is my DIY solution to this. Um, that's probably why everybody came. Um, but I figured out that you can buy an ESP32 online and a CC1101 uh, transceiver off Amazon and some essentially they can, they can call it DuPont connectors and no soldering required connect it up flash some firmware on it and read and transmit uh, our RF signals under a gigahertz essentially so it's very similar to the chip that's in the flipper for transceiving and then you get an ESP32 which are around 10 bucks on Amazon um, you can get them cheaper usually on like eBay and stuff like that but um, this is the way to go if you want to get into this it's I say around twenty to twenty-five dollars. If you go them on eBay, you can probably get them cheaper. If you want to wait for uh, shipping from China, um, but there's no soldering, nothing. You can just do this. Um, it does require some knowledge, and I'll get into that in a second. I'm trying to make this easy as possible, but there is some speed bumps you have to go through. So I talked about this a little bit, but just a background. If you don't know what the ESP32 is, it's a cheap Wi-Fi dev board essentially. Um, these are really popular in the uh, like home assistant communities and uh, home automation communities because they're so cheap. You can connect temperature sensors to these, G anything with GPIO, essentially, and have it connected to the Wi-Fi. Um, the previous version was ESP8266, and you can also use that to some degree, but um, the firmware I'll talk about in a minute is not, doesn't support that board specifically. You can make it work, but um, ESP32 has kind of dominated the market now. The CC1101 is a super popular radio transceiver chip. The IME we talked about at the beginning of this presentation has one of those chips inside of it. And those things go for $200 on eBay for some reason. Uh, you can find one of these chips for under $10 sometimes on eBay or slash Amazon and not pay $200 for a little kid's toy essentially. Uh, yeah, you have to build it yourself, but you get a nice little terminal and I'll get into why you can do this remotely as well. Uh, the DuPont jumper kits you can find on Amazon and eBay for ridiculously cheap. Um, but uh, both of these together will make it so you can have a, a hacking device like a flipper, but for 20 bucks, for RF at least. The software. This is the big thing that everybody's curious about. I didn't write this software. I stumbled upon this one day by mistake when I was researching this, and it shocked me that nobody, this doesn't have more uh, a wider audience that uses it. Uh, it's called RF Quack. Uh, I didn't name it, but um, it's essentially an SDR without a SDR. It uses the CC1101 and a bunch of different boards. You can use a Teensy. Uh, you can actually use other boards as well that support like 2.4 gigahertz uh, protocols, such as Wi-Fi or custom uh, NRF chips uh, to do that. Uh, but it, what it does is it abstracts the radio module layer. So you can interact with that radio module without having to like code in C and Arduino. So it's really handy, but you can still have register access, which is handy. Uh, you can interact with it over an IPython shell, which I had never messed with, but it's super convenient. And you can also do over MQTT, so you can do it remotely. There's a GitHub link if you want to check it out. These slides, will, as I said before, will be on my GitHub page I'll mention in a second. Um, so first, how do you get this all working? So you, you, you order your devices and you get them mail, you say, I can't just plug these in and they get to work, right? No, unfortunately you can't. Um, that's why there's a little speed bump. This is speed bump number one. Uh, first, you have to flash your ESP32 with the firmware. Um, it doesn't take much to do it. You, it's all in Docker, so you can essentially run it on anything you want. Um, but once you do that, you have to then connect your ESP32 to your CC1101. So it takes a little bit of knowledge there for the pinouts. Um, but I highly recommend you double check your pinout because I took me three times before B-sides to figure out the pinout correctly. In this case, um, once you set that all up, uh, I'll have a script also on my GitHub at some point, I don't know if I put it up there yet, but um, that has what you have, the commands you have to run to get receiving uh, working on your CC1101 device. 
Um, there's some nuance that happens, and it's not super easy for decoding. But for 20 bucks, can you argue with it? It's if you want to DIY it yourself, <laughs> yeah, DIY it. Um, you can't beat 20 bucks for a little hacking device, and you get a mini SDR that doesn't just do garage doors; it can do more. Um, so once you set all that up and you set the frequency, the packet length, and, and then do optional Manchester decoding and encoding, then you can uh, do receiving. So um, part of this is saying you have to manually decode the data from, uh, from the RF Quack software, because right now I don't have the ability to write a complicated RF receiver <laughs> module for our RF Quack. Um, if somebody does have the experience, I would really appreciate some help doing this. But um, there's my GitHub link if you want to go there. I just made it public. Um, I'll upload these slides and anything else I can think of to this GitHub. So watch out tonight slash tomorrow. I'll put in the Discord as well. Um, but what we're going to do is a quick demo is I'm going to receive using my HackRF instead of the, this little device and show you. Uh oh, this got unplugged. Pause. We're good. The pinout's important. Um, but in this case, um, I'm going to show you how to use a hacker ref and the GNU radio scripts to, to uh, receive and transmit on these garage doors, uh, just to give you a quick demo. And then I'll show you how to view the actual raw data out of the RF Quack software. And I'll leave it up to uh, the uh, exercise for the reader to decode the data manually, because I did it once, and it took me several hours. But you can do it. And once you do it once, you can pretty reliably do it again. Remember, you only have to have one transmission. You capture one transmission, decode it, and I have your remote forever. That's a couple hours of work for a remote. That's not very much. Um, I will say that transmitting does not work currently. I have not figured out how to transmit with RF Quack. It's doable, but because there's two packets, it's really complicated. You have to do them in sequence. But it's Python, so you can write something like that in Python. Um, I just haven't had the time to sit down and write it, and other things take my attention most of the time. Uh, can I exit out of this? Is it going to work? We're still seeing your screen. Okay. That's fine. Okay. Can everybody see that? Okay. Uh, I'm just going to, I'll just drag something over there for a second. Is it over here? Yeah, here we go. Okay, so here's GNU Radio. So this is, I can't see that. I duplicate. That's fine. That's fine. Uh, so in this case, this is GNU Radio. This is what you use to, this is part of Sec Plus, that um, uh, GitHub repo. And you can see uh, GNU Radio is hard. I tried to figure out what these, all these blocks do, and I could not figure out, I think, 50% of them. Most of them are pretty self-explanatory. Um, I am not RF engineer. I don't have background with this. Um, I'm a pen tester by day, so I like hacking on things, but I don't have a lot of RF experience. I'm working on getting that, but um, work, running this is not that difficult. So in this case, I'm going to plug in the garage door, and I'll show you how this works. As you, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, it's bright. Um, so as you can see, garage door thinks it's online right now, uh, or garage door opener. Um, the light will go off in a second, but um, I have my little remote right here. This is a remote for this garage door, and I was testing this, so I pressed the button a bunch of times without this thing being plugged in. So it's much ahead of the garage door. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to record this real fast. There we go. OK, so now it's running. You can see there at the bottom, as long as it didn't exit out, we're fine. And there's a little handy screen that pops up, too. I'll drag this over so you can see it. Oh, I clicked on the wrong thing. Why can't I drag this? There we go. So there's this handy screen that pops up. 
that shows you the frequency. So you can change the frequency if you want. I can't, sorry, I can't make that any bigger. Um, essentially, it's just a frequency graph. So I have my little remote. I'm going to step away for a second and press it, and this will probably go after the second press, but we'll see. The reason I'm stepping away is because the, re the remote and the garage door hate it when they're too close. You essentially are screaming at each other at a super close range, and you'll blow out the transmitter, and it won't actually open. So during my testing with the Hacker F2, it was like it wasn't working because I was testing it this close, like four uh, inches away. And it was like, I don't know what you're saying. And then I backed up like 10 feet. And it was like, oh, I know perfectly what you're saying. So there's an issue with gain or something with a lot of these. But uh, they're not meant to be used within like a couple feet of the transmitter uh, or the receiver, excuse me. But I'm going to back up a little bit off camera. But you should hear it go. Received it, and there it goes. It's really quiet, but it's opening. If you can hear it, it's opening right now. So essentially, right, stop it. So, so I stopped it because it doesn't have a limit switch or anything like that right now. So if you saw down the corner, what did we receive? Some values. So both of those values should have been, I can't see that. So there's the rolling and fixed codes there, represented as integers. So both of those values, um, does anybody know the shortcut on Ubuntu for screen sharing? Is it super K or whatever? Or super B for P? Okay. Oh, you're right. Thank you. I'm going to mirror. There we go. You still see? Cool. OK, so I can explain this better. Should have done this before. Down here at the bottom, you can see um, we have, it's kind of small, I apologize, but we have rolling, fixed, and then it actually breaks down what button I pressed. So I actually have three buttons. I haven't mapped the other two. But if we press this away from this, you'll see another one pops up. And the button ID changed. It's 208 instead of 210 because I pressed the second button on here. So you can imagine if you capture any of the buttons on here, you can essentially fake another button. Um, this is important because when we want to transmit, um, we have to have the rolling code and the fixed code. So we're going to go back to a different script real fast. And we're actually going to transmit and open the garage door with my hacker ref. So in this case, we're going to go back to receive and copy the rolling code value. So this is that one that changes every time. If you did notice, if you paid really close attention, the value actually, um, actually we're going to take the last one. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it doesn't decode properly too when you're close by, so this may not work first try, but I have confirmed this works many times when transmitting. So we're going to set the frequency to the same frequency, rolling code to whatever we want, which is this value. And we're going to grab the fixed code, which is down here, which is a different. We're going to use the same uh, value because we want the same button because we want this to actually open. Paste that in there. And then I forgot we have to increase by one, remember? So we're going to go back to rolling code. Actually, one second, I might have clicked the wrong one. I clicked the wrong one. Sorry. Give me a second. That's the old version I was typing in before. So we actually have to paste in the correct value for the um, version two. Remember, because there's two versions that are incompatible. So I was using the old version. They're very similar. That's why it's hard to tell them apart. But that's OK. We will use the same value before. Am I good on time? Yeah. yeah. I'm just running out of batteries. Oh, I'm sorry. Give me one second to get this all set up. And you will see that the garage door will open. Rolling code. Let's see. You can automate this, but it's kind of picky.
But once you have the rolling code value, oops, wrong one, and the fixed code, you're golden. Essentially, nobody can uh, take away your ability to gain access to somebody's garage, essentially. Okay, so I changed it by one. I increased it by one, so hopefully this works. I'm a little close, but I'll, I'll take my chances. So I'm gonna transmit and see what happens. Resource, oh, because I have it open. One second. Oh, perfect timing. Okay, play this again and see what happens. And the garage door opened. There we go. And it's confused because it has no idea what's going on. Um, but in this case, we've successfully captured and I can come back at any point in the future and replay codes as much as I want. So you can do the same thing with your flipper and I will be around after the talk if you want to test this. This is my testing garage door so you can not feel bad if you, uh, I wouldn't say don't break my garage door please, but um, you can feel free to test it because you might not want to test it on your real garage door. But everybody probably came for the budget version of this, right? So I don't have a hacker ref, what, what do you do, right? Sorry, I'm getting thirsty. Um, in this case, use something like RF Quack. So I'm gonna switch over to a terminal here and boot up my Docker instance. Uh, that's a problem. Oh, I don't have it plugged in. One second. It would help if I plugged it in. So essentially all I did was build a Docker image and Docker firmware for this, and then ran uh, the Docker image for the CLI in, uh, uh, tool, I guess is what you call it. Uh, I'm using an extremely old version of this. The newer version is way easier to use, uh, but in this case I'm just using Docker. So once it's booted up, I get an interface. This is IPython. Uh, can I make this bigger probably is a good idea. Okay, can everybody see that? Is that big enough? So essentially uh, what we're gonna do is I don't have anything currently in front of me, but what you can do is you can interact with a radio uh, and you get tab to complete as well. But you would do something like set and then it actually lets you tab to complete, which is nice. Set modem config, so we're gonna set modulation equals on off keying. I didn't talk about this. This is getting way into the weeds with the technical side. But this is essentially saying Morse code for data. This is on off. So you're just saying, you're gonna say a one is on and a zero is off. There's different encoding schemes, but that's the kind of low level understanding of that. And then we're gonna set um, the frequency. So I'm gonna have to pull up my slides for a second. And I have this, this will be on GitHub so you can set this yourself. I just never remember every, every, every little option. So we're gonna say carrier frequency next. Equals, and this is just an integer. So garage doors are roughly around the 315 or 310 or 390 megahertz ranges. Um, it's a little weird because most of the other stuff's like 340, uh, 433 or 915 or somewhere around there. But garage doors are special for some reason. Then we're gonna set next the uh, bit rate, which is for security plus 2.0 is 4.0. So bit rate, I'm gonna capitalize it, equals 4.0. And then use CRC, I know this one. We're gonna set that to false because there's no CRC in this algorithm. It's kind of built into it. And then sync word. I think it's sync words, let me double check. Yeah, sync words, and this is just an empty byte array. Uh, this isn't too big, this isn't too important because um, in this case, you could set up sync words, but um, it's a little picky. I haven't figured this out yet. That's part of the future work I'll talk about in a second, but. After we do that, we see that all the changes are applied. Next, we're gonna set, we can set fixed packet length. I'm not gonna do that because this is just a demo to show you you can receive with this. Um, and then Manchester encoding, 
I'm not 100% sure if this is required or not. Um, I was running into some issues today where some of the data I was receiving was wrong. So I'm not 100% sure why that is. I don't know if it's because of interference. Uh, the demo that I was going to do with this, this nice remote with this uh, and de actually decode it kind of fell through at last second because of that. Um, but I have definitely done this by hand and it has worked and I've gotten the value that I've gotten out of my hacker ref and they've been the same. So uh, you can do this, but let's receive. So there's probably going to be a lot of noise around here. Oop, wrong window. So all you do is you do q.radioa.rx and enter. And now we're receiving. So all packets on 315 megahertz are going to be showing up here. Now, luckily, this isn't really busy, but if I press this far enough away so it doesn't get thing, we get output. There you go. Now, if you were to take two of these packets together, uh, you can see at this bottom one right here, this, this is probably the first packet. You see here you got 255, you got a preamble, and then you've got some data. And then afterwards you've got the preamble, there's a bunch of A's right there, and then you've got the data here. So that's packet one, packet two. Once you decode those, you get the rolling and fixed codes straight out of the air. And the SEC plus Python module will do a lot of this for you. All you have to do is convert it into a bit stream and a valid trinary. And I was running into issues with the trinary. I don't know if it's bit rate problems or what. Again, I'm not an RF engineer, so I don't know everything I'm talking about. But at least I've done this once. So um, you can do this for 20 bucks. And in my opinion, uh, you're trading $20 for the ease of use in this case. Um, but it's not the end of the world. Um, I did press a second button on this, uh, so it's going to be different, but there you go. You can transmit also. So if you do like q.radioa. Here you can see that there's, there's also jam, which I don't recommend you do. Um, but there's transmit, there's idle, there's send. So this is all Python too. So you think that I'm using a USB 0, I'm using a serial console but it's Python. So you could theoretically implement this in Python yourself and uh, for any protocol. It's really easy. And when I saw this, I was like, why isn't this more popular? Because for 20 bucks, why not? Um, just as an example, I am going to idle this real fast. So idle just means that I don't want to receive anything. And I'm going to go about and change the bit rate to 2, which is the bit rate of Security Bus 1.0. And I have another remote here. And also has history, which is really nice. And I'm going to sit here and click the other remote. So this is the old style remote. And you can see here the data comes through again. So we have two separate protocols in the remote so we can now uh, essentially manually decode. But again, you only need one of these remote transmissions, so two packets that you can get together. And I pwned your garage door forever essentially, unless you reset it. Um, there's a reason why I went out and bought one of these, because I didn't want to test my own garage door, because that's terrifying. Um, but uh, yeah, you can do this essentially all day long without, um, without anybody noticing. You're just listening. And then when you go two years down the road, how many people replace their garage door openers in two years? Nobody. Uh, there you go. So back to my slides real fast, and I'll finish up. I know we're probably coming up on some time limits. I don't know. What are we at? 45 minutes? OK. I'll, I'll make, these last slides are pretty quick. So once we've done that, um, I am the remote now. Um, so I griped about my queue in, a, in the past, but um, I have some more gripes I want to air out. Uh, if you were at my B-Sides talk, you probably saw this. Um, you, oh, OK. I'll be extra loud. Um, my queue is kind of bad with software. Um, do you remember in the 90s when they put stickers on everything saying, you must read the terms of service before you open this product, and the terms of service were inside the box? Um, they did that with my garage door opener when I bought it. They said, go to this link and read it, and you accept it if you break the seal on this bag. I was like, that's funny. And it was even better because there's a section about reverse engineering the my queue protocol. So, I would bet you that there's a ton of vulnerabilities in the MyQ uh, uh, API. Now, they do fix some every once in a while, and they change it all the time. But man, I would love to see their security inbox, because essentially they're saying, yeah, 
you have to ask us for permission to test our stuff, and we're going to probably tell you no. Not, hey, if you find a vulnerability, you should report it. It's, uh, yeah, you must ask for permission before you do it. I didn't reach out to them because this does not relate to the, my, uh, my Q system at all, uh, and I did not touch the MyQ system. But um, this is just kind of explanation of, in my opinion, who the Chamberlain company is. They are not very receptive to security testing, in my opinion. Now, it's just an opinion. That's not a fact. But um, another gripe I have about Chamberlain, why the heck are your remotes so expensive? I went on AliExpress. This was in 2022. And found the exact same model, essentially, like molds and everything for $8 plus four shipping, 450 shipping. And I guarantee that you could probably find one for half that if you really tried. Why are you selling it at the big orange store, um, not the place where you save big money, the orange store? Um, and, and you can see here the three button remote is $30. And this was back, I took this picture at one of the big orange stores in, I think it was Urbandale. And I was like, okay, that's, that's not bad. I went back and checked this week, they went up you have to pay almost $40 now for a replacement remote for a piece of plastic and a simple circuit board and like two ICs. That's it. That's all that's in here. And I'll even break it open for you if you want and come up here. There's probably under $5 worth of like raw materials in this and they're charging you $40 if you buy it online. It's ridiculous. Now you can buy the cheap uh, knockoff versions uh, online for less, but that's not the point. Why is Chamberlain essentially selling remotes? Because they know you're going to lose it. How often do people change their garage door openers? Not very often. How do they make money? The remotes. It's like printers and ink. They're going to jack up the ink because you've already brought a printer. And there's a bunch of other things too. You can see here the, the keychain remote that I was mentioning before is $35. And it actually went up. It's almost $50, I think, now for a, a thing that's no bigger than this and you put on your keychain. And this is just a piece of plastic. I don't know why they're doing this, and they would probably sell a lot more if they were cheaper. So I mentioned future work. Um, so if anybody would like to contribute, uh, I would greatly appreciate this. I'm not fully invested this full time, and this is not something I'm uh, currently working on or anything, but implementing auto decode with RF Quack and a custom module would be awesome. Roll Jam is actually in RF Quack already. Somebody's made a module. Um, if you can even just transmit Security Plus or Security Plus 2.0 packets using ArcQuack, awesome. That'd be awesome. Put it uh, in the Discord. I will congratulate you and make a, if you want me to make a PR on RFQuack, I will. I don't care. Let's make this, let's find cheaper ways to hack garage door openers. Um, there's also even cheaper ways to do this. Uh, this is probably the easiest, but if you really want to, if you're really comfortable with hardware and the RF side, you can buy cheap little, essentially, hard coded 315 megahertz transmitters on Amazon for like $2. And if you, remember it's on off keying, if you get the right sequence, there you go. Arduino in one of those, under, you can probably get it for under five bucks. So look at that. Uh, if you've ever heard of, uh, RPi TX, which is essentially using a Raspberry Pi with a GPIO pin uh, hacked together to make a transmitter, you can transmit uh, these codes essentially on that. It's a little hacky, but you can do it. And if you have an Raspberry Pi, then it's free. Um, here's, a, here's another link uh, about MyQ RF door sensors at McAfee. Uh, they did a pretty nice breakdown of this. I think they worked with Chamberlain about this uh, vulnerability for uh, responsible disclosure. Great on them but um, there was an issue where you could jam the door sensors and fake your garage door being opened. Take that with the garage door, um, this vulnerability with Security Plus and Security Plus 2.0, marry them together. I can be in your garage even if you have my queue and you won't know because that's a sensor on your garage door. So that's, that's another problem. And they fixed this, but it, it, all it takes is another similar vulnerability like that. Remember, everything's RF in this case too, so just jam it and it'll be fine. Now, I want to open up the floor for questions. I want to make sure I have enough time for that. But uh, as I said, I'll be here afterwards if you want to come up and mess with this for at least a little bit. Um, I have my flipper, too, uh, if anybody wants to see what a flipper is, if you haven't seen one, and a hacker ref and stuff like that. But questions? And we have online people, too, probably. I don't know. 
Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Um, the question was, um, what are some examples of encrypted systems on the market? I don't know of any. Um, I was speculating before the presentation uh, with somebody that there is a, a good idea to make a garage door opener that's encrypted. If you can make one and make it reliable as a startup or whatever, I'm sure tons of people will take, take the bait and buy one because I would because they're, and a fun fact, these units are just a motor and an interface with a circuit board bolted on the back of them. Make a circuit board that fits in this enclosure and you repl replaceable and it's like four wires and you're done and some relays. If you can make one of those and have nice security like with pass keys or something on your phone or whatever and make it open, the home assistant community will love you straight off the bat. So. Because I couldn't figure out, oh yes, sorry. Um, question was, why didn't I transmit with the ESP32? Because I haven't figured it out yet. Um, the reason it's hard is because the ESP32 is, and the CC1101, you have to transmit the packets together, but also there has to be enough separation. So the packets have to be a certain uh, length apart, milliseconds wise. And again, I'm not an RF engineer, so I don't know how to fully break that down and do all that. And then also the encoding and decoding um, probably would have to happen automatically at that point. And I just didn't have enough time to do that. But I've laid the seeds. And if you want to go do that, I would highly recommend you do. <laughs> uh, again, I don't have the, again, time to dig into that all the time and do that. And again, I, there, I've run into some other roadblocks as well with that for decoding. But it's probably just because I don't know RF enough. Hopefully that answers your question. Yes. We have one from Kevin online. Yes. Uh, so he says on the SDR for under 30, uh, if you think it can be used uh, on the reverse side to receive transmissions, VHF, UHF, or stuff like CAM, or RF Doppler direction finder? That's a good question. So the question was, do you think that for the SDR under 20 bucks, could you use it for um, other RF ranges, I'll just say, so like uh, VHF, UHF, Doppler, radar, anything like that? Uh, possibly. You'd have to probably find a RF module that works with RF Quack. RF Quack is a really neat modular kind of program, and you can actually request that they support these transmitters. So if you could find something uh, like a module out of a Tesla, and you could say, oh, it just runs on I squared C, and you can get the data out of it, there you go. You can now. Uh, receive and transmit data from that and possibly build it into RF Quack. I don't know how to do that. I'm, I don't have the experience to build something like that, but if you have a hardware engineer and you knew how to like, interact with it, absolutely. You, you can build anything like this and it's extremely um, kind of modular in that case where I've seen you can connect multiple modules together. So you can do like roll jam has to have two because you have to have one to jam and one to receive and transmit. So you can have two, you could have two different types. You could have uh, sub gigahertz and 2.4 gigahertz for like a wireless mouse and stuff like that. I think somebody has a demo for the mouse attack. I think it's mouse jack on uh, RF Quack. I think I saw that. Somebody's made a module for it and things like that. So yes and no, but I don't know of any modules out there right now that do that. Any other questions? Um, so the question was, could you make more money <laughs> making a universal remote instead of like an encrypted remote? Probably, but you'd probably get undercut really fast with um, all the manufacturers in China, for example, because if you go on AliExpress and Alibaba, you'll see that the prices are insanely low for remotes. And that was kind of my, part of my research was looking into Alibaba and AliExpress where I'm, I'm like, how in the world do they know these protocols? Like, did they just rip off the chips or something? And sure enough, no, somebody over in China figured out the protocol, didn't tell anybody about it, and just made these remotes. And yeah, so somebody, somebody had to reverse engineer the protocol at some point to do this. It's not like a ship that you get off the factory and then you make this. Like, you have to figure out how to do this. Now, maybe they got Chamberlain rejects, but most of their factories are in the United States. So I don't know how they were able to do that. 
My guess is that somebody reverse engineered the protocol, didn't tell anybody, made remotes, and that's where a lot of those are coming from. Uh, that's just speculation at that point, but I would bet that that's a lot of other things as well for RF security, where somebody knows about it and they just don't want to share it because there's too much money involved, right? If you make a million remotes and sell for a dollar a piece, that's a lot of money. Any other questions? Again, I will be around afterwards for at least a little bit um, to talk about this and all this stuff up here. So thank you, and I appreciate you coming to listen to my talk. <laughs>